So I'd like to thank the organizing committee for having me here today. My um, disclosures include um, the ones listed. And I had a special disclosure because I'm talking about wait times and I've been a patient. I'm a gynae cancer surgeon. I've been the head of the division. I've been doing some health services research. So I wear a number of different hats, so I'm not sure which one's gonna come through in this presentation. So for sure I want to get to um, whether wait times from diagnosis to surgery impact on survival in gynecologic cancer care. And I also want to uh, discuss a little bit about the patient lived experience with her cancer. And how I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna talk about what do wait times mean? Are they actually rising or are they a figment of both the patient and the doctor's imagination? Um, do wait times affect survival? Um, how do they affect the patient experience? And are there any solutions? So this is actually some data out of Calgary where um, Dr. Vera and colleagues looked at cervix and vulvar cancer. And what you can see is a whole list of uh, wait times here from the primary care visit to surgery, uh, which is the patient's um, perspective, all the way down to the gynae oncologist sees the patient to surgery, which is the surgeon's perspective. So wait times can mean a bunch of different things. And there was a very detailed review done by Neil, which showed 15 different definitions for wait times. And they were anchored based on symptoms, when the patient was first seen by the primary care physician, when they were referred, when they were seen by the specialist, uh, when the diagnosis was made, and when treatment actually happened. So in order to understand the literature, you need to make sure you're comparing apples to apples and not apples to fruit salad. So are wait times actually increasing? This is work that Dr. Simonovic from um, Cancer Surgery Ontario did, um, and it's old, it's 1993 to 2000. And what you can see here is in the four different cancers listed, there was actually an increase over that seven year period of time. And the strongest indicators for why those um, wait times were increasing was patient um, advanced age and comorbidities. So um, in order to understand if gynecologic cancers are um, uh, changing, uh, this is data from um, Dr. Kwan, who's now in Vancouver, but this is the Ontario data. And what she showed from 1996 to 2000 that there was an increase of about eight, time, eight days in the median um, time from um, diagnosis of uterine cancer by biopsy to a hospital admission for surgery. And in her study, she showed that again, advanced age, multiple comorbidities, um, surgery in a teaching hospital or surgery by a gynae oncologist all advanced um, or increased your risk of longer wait times. And out of that paper, um, they advocated that there be a look at the referral criteria for women in Ontario getting their surgery in a cancer hospital versus a community hospital. And what you can see here um, also in the data is that 40% of the cases in uterine cancer were being done in 20% of the hospitals, and 20% of those cases were being done by 2% of the surgeons, which was the gynae oncologist. Um, in terms of um, the uterine cancer story, um, O'Leary looked at a different period of time, and she used the definition of not just endometrioid adenocarcinoma, but also including the sarcoma group. And you can see over that um, advanced period of time that the wait, median wait times had dramatically increased um, by 15 days. Um, in the year-by-year -year analysis, um, you can see that the wait times for uterine cancer surgery increased until about 2006, and then they stabilized. So what actually happened in Ontario um, was that Cancer Care Ontario realized that there was a problem with getting cancer patients to the OR, and so they infused money for people who had a cancer diagnosis into those hospitals that were providing 
um, care on a per case basis. And that's exactly around 2005, 2006, that program started, and that kind of stabilized the wait times. Um, the problem is that um, Cancer Care Ontario defined in 2006 that the target for getting cancer surgery, and they used from referral to specialist and decision for surgery to treatment um, should be in six weeks. And we were only meeting that criteria in Ontario in about 50% of the population. Other trends that came out in the O'Leary paper was that there was a marked shift from 20% of the cancer cases in uterine disease happening in teaching hospitals to 40%. Um, Ontario in the middle of this had done a surgical standard that said stage one, grade one could be done by any gynae person, um, whereas anything beyond that, grade two, three, stage one, or any higher stage should have their surgery in a cancer hospital. If you look at the Creaseman data on clear surgical staging with detailed um, pathology information, we could predict that about 60% of cases would end up in the teaching hospitals needing to be done by gynae cancer surgeons. So we weren't there yet in 2009. Um, O'Leary looked at what were the prognostic factors leading to increasing wait times. Yes, teaching hospitals, older age, um, gynae oncology, doing the surgery had a higher uh, wait time. Um, patients of lower income quintile had a slightly lower wait time, and sarcoma cases um, had a markedly lower wait time. Stoll um, out of the US looked at a tenfold larger population of endometrioid adenocarcinomas, and they found the same thing, that um, as time advanced, there was an increasing risk of um, having longer wait times beyond six weeks. And the factors that they found, again, were the older age, um, comorbidities, black or Hispanic background, Medicaid or uninsured, and lower education. So um, question is, are these wait times that are getting longer acceptable? Um, this isn't specific for cancer, but in general, in Canada, we have much longer wait times than in the European community. And within Canada, BC does much better than Ontario in terms of getting their patients to the OR across all disease types. In 1999, um, the Crossing the Quality Chasm Institute of Medicine report said that in order to provide quality medicine, you need to meet certain benchmarks involving safety, effective care, patient-centered care, timeliness, efficient, and equitable care. And timeliness, or wait times, is actually a reflection of problems within or advantages within the healthcare system. So why are those wait times getting longer? Um, it could be because there's a whole piece of pre-surgical um, investigations that are required. Um, it could be because there are limited resources, um, limited number of operating rooms. There has been a shift in certain cancer types from community hospitals to teaching hospitals, and so there's a blossoming of volume in the teaching hospitals. And there's also been a shift over the last decade from open surgery to laparoscopic surgery or robotic surgery, which we know takes slightly longer. There are a limited number of surgical specialists, like gynae oncologists. Um, there are fixed hospital budgets, and there can be other issues in other di jurisdictions related to um, funding, like the insured versus uninsured patient. So are there any recommendations about how long it's okay to wait for cancer operation? Um, four weeks has been put forward in Canada and the UK. Um, the American chest physician said eight weeks. A whole number of different networks, agencies, cancer groups have um, fallen into line with this idea of a four to six week benchmark. So is there actually evidence that shows waiting longer makes outcomes worse. So I know you can't read this table, but if you look at the right 
I guess it's on your side, the left column, those are all of the different cancer types. The next two columns are the studies that show, yes, there's a link between wait times and outcomes in terms of survival in the retrospective data. The other two columns show a lot more studies um, where there's no clear answer. So I'm just gonna focus in on the gynecologic diseases. Again, um, going back to uterine cancer, and this is using the definition of both the endometrioid cancers plus the sarcomas as a uterine cancer. Um, we showed um, back in the era of the 2000 to 2009 that about 50% of the surgeries were being done by gyneonchs and the other were being done by the gynecolo gynecologists and 70% of that population was endometrioid adenocarcinoma. When you looked at the continuous um, number of weeks between biopsy to surgery, um, the, there seemed to be a cutoff around the 12-week mark that survival was um, dropping, and I'll try and show it a different way here. So within two weeks and after two weeks are the bottom two lines. And then um, two to six weeks and six to 12 weeks um, are your subsequent lines. So something happened around 12 weeks uh, between biopsy and surgery uh, where survival fell. And this was the first study in the literature that had actually shown an impact of wait times on survival. And when we put into the regression model things like patient factors, location of surgery, teaching versus community hospital, surgeon type, none of those affected survival. The only factor that was prognostic was the wait time for surgery. Um, Stoll then in the US did that much bigger project of 112,000 women with endometrioid adenocarcinoma. And in their data set, um, it wasn't 12 weeks. They found the benchmark at six weeks. And again, they found that there were a number of factors that were associated um, with survival. Again, the, um, the race, um, whether or not they had insurance, the lowest income quartile, their education status and comorbidity, as well as high-grade disease. And what Stoll went on to say was, are these wait times a reflection of poor survival, or is wait times really just a reflection of other issues like complex social influences that are causing poor survival, geographic barriers, delays in medical clearance, uh, need for subspecialized um, optimization of the patient, or that the patient is actually causing the delays um, themselves from their choices. So um, her suggestion in the article was to minimize so surgical wait times and to put um, resources into those patients that are going to potentially um, have longer wait times because of um, needing medical clearance and those kind of issues. In cervical cancer, we have one study from Thailand that showed in stage 1A2 to 1B1 um, patients for radical hysterectomy and pelvic node dissection, that wait times um, in that jurisdiction were an average of 43 days. Um, they did not use a continuous um, cutoff um, to look at whether it should be four weeks greater or less or eight weeks greater and less to get to the OR. Um, they looked at recurrence um, free survival as well as overall survival, and they did not find that wait times were important in the study that they had planned to do. They found that deep stromal invasion and lymph node metastases were important in overall survival. But they did an exploratory analysis looking at what happened five years after the surgery. And in that analysis, they did find that those women who waited longer than eight weeks for their surgery, from diagnosis to hospitalization, had a poorer outcome than those who waited less than that time. And here you can see the survival curves. They don't, um, they don't um, bifurcate until after the five-year time frame. So it is exploratory. It wasn't the pre-planned analysis. There have been a number of other researchers um, with smaller sample size that have asked the question and have found no impact of wait times on outcome. It was just that exploratory analysis by the Thai group. In ovarian cancer, I couldn't find any data 
but I will make the comment that during the time that wait times have been advancing, we've also had a change in the practice of ovarian cancer care um, because these women come to us very symptomatically and because of the three randomized trials where um, neoadjuvant chemo followed by surgery versus surgery followed by neoadjuvant chemo has had um, the same outcomes. I believe there's probably also been a practice change where these women are getting um, neoadjuvant chemo because um, we probably can't get them to the OR um, in a timely fashion to deal with their symptoms and make a treatment diagnosis and do the debulking. In terms of the patient experience of her cancer, I'm sure every jurisdiction has new newspaper articles around patients being really upset that they're not getting to the OR in a timely fashion. Um, this waiting for their surgery date can be anxiety provoking. It can decrease their satisfaction with the care that they're receiving and it can also lead to poor quality of life. And the data that we have in this area, um, CAR showed that um, really how the patient reacts to the wait time depends on how she perceives that wait time. In some people who are having a lot of pain or where the waiting is anxiety provoking, it means a different thing to them than where they don't have pain. Um, if the waiting seems to be a waste of time to the patient versus that patient who can get a lot of things done before they're incapacitated by their surgery, they will interpret that wait time differently. And um, it, it all depends on how they view the wait time as to how they're going to respond. There has been um, two studies, one in a large group of patients, including multiple cancer sites, where they looked at different tools to evaluate anxiety, cancer-specific um, problems, um, health expectations, and the Factors that um, were related to quality of life, related to waiting, were how vital they felt or fatigued that they were experiencing versus their mental health in terms of anxiety and depression. Related to satisfaction with the healthcare system, there's been one larger study done by Robinson looking at both ovarian and endometrial cancer patients. And they did, again, a series of um, uh, tools including quality of life, disease specific quality of life, anxiety, and patient satisfaction with their care. And what they found was that wait times in ovarian cancer were associated um, with a woman's overall feeling of well being, um, whether or not she was having a problem with intake and her satisfaction um, with her healthcare team. In endometrial cancer, again, what was related to wait times was the overall quality of life, her role functioning or her social functioning, whether or not fatigue was a part of her experience, and um, whether or not she was experiencing both insomnia or constipation. In this um, latter study, patient satisfaction with um, the healthcare team was profoundly affected the longer the wait time took, and in particular in the endometrial cancer population. So um, when you look at wait times, there are a whole bunch of endpoints that you can use. You can use survival, you can look at risk recurrence, disease-related morbidity, treatment-related morbidity, shift in stage, psychological adjustment. So um, the literature is full of any one of these um, outcomes, um, and there's not a lot of literature out there. Um, but um, Neil, who was one of the people I presented up front with the 15 definitions of wait times, has said um, that um, treatment um, care um, may, or time to treatment care may vary depending on the cancer. It may not be a one all time, so ovarian cancer may need a very different wait time than endometrial cancer. We just don't have the data, and different cancers across different disease types may have different wait times that are appropriate and affect survival. Um, there may be a policy that could help fast track patients who have a fast or a high suspicion of cancer, and I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. 
Um, we don't have a lot of data on the patient experience other than in gynae cancer, those two previous studies that um, I um, showed you. And really the whole issue of wait times is an organizational um, process within the healthcare service. So I know this is a busy slide, it's more of a brainstorming slide, but um, what could help in all of this? So in Overy, um, we don't have any fast track services in our Canadian culture, but they are trying that um, scenario within the UK where if there's a patient with a pelvic mass, they get fast track to like a lung DAP or a whatever called the ovarian DAP, where they can have all of their tests done at one-stop shopping. Their CA-125, their ultrasound, their referral, and seeing the gynae oncologist and get put on the OR wait list. Right now, we have a very fragmented service, at least in Ontario, where they have to do one thing at a time. Could that help? Um, it would help at the pre-surgical consult, um, kind of collapsing that wait time. Um, we do have a multidisciplinary process within um, most of our jurisdictions of Canada, but do we have one-stop shopping for the pre-op piece and all of the consults? Or do we have a one-stop shopping if you need to have hepatobiliary and colorectal and the colonoscopy and all of that done? Again, that would shrink the amount of time people are waiting um, for the pre-op assessment. Um, certainly grade one, stage one uterine cancers could be done by any gynecologist. Do they have to be done by a gynecologist in a teaching hospital or since all of this time has been built within the community hospital because we've had all these cases shift to the teaching hospital, should a patient from a teaching hospital city be referred into the community to get that low risk disease taken care of? Um, how do we build capacity? How do we increase ORs without building more ORs? Um, one of the strategies Ontario has taken is to increase the number of gynaeonc centers um, to try and relieve the pressure off um, Mecca. Um, we could say, sorry, it's a cancer case. You may want to um, cancel our OR at 2.30 in the afternoon because our first case went longer, but no more. No more case cancellations at 2.30 in the afternoon. Everybody's got to pull up their pants and they got to get the cases done. Uh, no OR closures at Christmas or spring bake. We've got to do the cancer cases despite um, uh, school holidays or Christmas holidays. Um, the ORs are empty after six o'clock at night and on the weekends. So do we run the ORs longer? Um, it would be a game changer in terms of gynaeonc physician staffing to um, a uh, different kind of model because you can't have a gynaeonc surgeon operating from eight in the morning till 11 and still be effective. Um, or do we run the OR seven days a week? We've had to do that in Hamilton um, a few years ago where we had to operate on Saturdays because after Christmas closure, we just had such a bad um, lot of uh, number of cases that we had to get on top of the volume. I would um, put forward to GOC that one of the things um, we need to train gynae onks in is how do we advocate as leaders in our hospitals and as um, leaders within um, our jurisdiction to the provincial ministries of health or our cancer centers that this is a big problem and it does need to be dealt with. And I would put it on the plate of our patient advocate um, group that this needs to come front and center because we do have evidence that it is a problem and it does affect survival. So um, what I've tried to show you is that wait times are getting longer, not just in Ontario, but um, across North America. We do have retrospective data showing that at least in uterine cancer, um, wait times are affected with survival. Um, we do have um, preliminary data showing that anxiety and satisfaction with the quality um, of life in the healthcare team um, is affected um, by wait times. Uh, wait times is a structural issue. It's related to our hospitals and how our hospitals um, are um, providing access to resources um, to get us to the OR and the system and processes changes are required to deal with this. So my first question for you is, are wait times for surgery rising in North America? 
One is yes, no is two, three is this talk is so boring I wasn't listening, and four is no one seems to care, so why should I? I really thought people would answer four. <laughs> <laughs> and my second question for you is, why are wait times increasing? It's all because of laparoscopy. Uh, the number of women with gynae cancers is increasing. Number three, too many cases are sent to the teaching hospital. Number four, higher rates of complete surgical staging, and I could add to there now secondary debulking. And then five, all of the above. Okay, and then the last question. There is irrefutable evidence that the longer you wait for surgery, the lower the survival from endometrial cancer. Number one, yes. Number two, no. Number three, I've got a headache. And number four, I really don't know. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Ellett. We have time for some questions from the audience. Go ahead. So Laurie, can I ask you a question? I'm a medical oncologist, so I know nothing. But I did <laughs> listen. Um, we seem to, you obviously believe the data. So I think actually how long you survive all relates to the biology of your cancer endometrial cancer, which seems to be the one example where it might matter, and somehow cancer is very clever and know that 12 weeks matters. Um, what about the biology of these different, we don't know what endometrial cancer is anymore. In all of those analyses, was it endometrial cancer as a big group, or was there any sub-analysis so that it was the serous people waiting a long time? Because I assume if you've got stage one, grade one, you could wait two years because you give people progesterones when they've got grade one in young people wanting to maintain fertility. So do you think it's biology or do you think there's a true system problem? Because to fix a system problem is going to cost a lot of money to pay unionized staff to work seven days a week. The value for money is an issue. So neither the Stoll study or the one we did in Ontario went through biology, but the way I could answer that is the Ontario study, there was a group that was getting their surgery in less than two weeks, and that was the um, predominantly sarcoma or suspicious for sarcoma population, and they did worse. They did um, as bad as the greater than 12-week population. So on that kind of crude assessment, the sarcoma people are worse than the endometrioid adenocarcinoma group. Um, but there was no sub-analysis into the other histologies or grades in, in either the STOL or our study. Marcus? Sorry. So just in terms of the endometrial cancer story and the data that you're presenting, a lot of it has to do from time to biopsy to surgery. Uh, we know that there is a huge, you know, even probably more significant timeline even prior to that, which is prior to the biopsy. And I just wonder especially since, well, there's two things. Number one is that the majority of cases are probably still done by generalists, even though that has changed since your data from 2004. Um, and yet they're not really part of that discussion. I think when they get their referrals and triage their cases, I'm not sure that they triage cancer any differently in terms of wait time. So I think if you speak to family physicians, they'll say it still takes three months or four months to get into a gynecologist's office. So I think since they are, uh, I mean, I think the general gynecologists are uh, an integral part of this discussion because they're in some ways the blocking to get to the gynae oncologist in many cases. So you have to wait to see a gynecologist for four months, then you get a biopsy, then they'll get the results back, then they'll make a referral to a gynae oncologist. So that seems somewhat flawed to me because especially endometrial cancer where the majority of patients are presenting with, an, with bleeding, postmenopausal bleeding, that that's a, a significant timeline. We need to consider maybe doing things differently and I want your thoughts on that. So you're suggesting an endometrial cancer potential LDAP. Um, it, it is um, a huge undertaking, but um, I don't know how else you would navigate. Well, I'm not even quick. sure is that if it's that big of an undertaking. I think you know, if you if you look at if you make it very clear that if you have postmenopausal bleeding, set up centers where you can get rapid biopsies. I mean, I, 
I think it's actually a very straightforward thing to do, and you probably change your wait times by five months for the average patient with endometrial cancer. So, something to consider. It's an interesting concept, yeah. Well, mine is more of comments um, than a question. I mean, I think the survival issue is very complex, and we're not going to get an answer because there are so many complicating factors that affect survival that I don't think from administrative databases we're going to really get any useful information. But for whatever, for psychological reasons and quality of life and for whatever parameters, you know, we... Um, as professionals have come up with wait time criteria. And I think that this has been our failure. So, you know, I have personally criticized CCO every single day for the past 15 years um, because we've collected wait time data since about 2000 and we have never met the criteria uh, to their satisfaction. And yet, like an idiot, we keep collecting the data. It's bad, we keep collecting, we don't do anything about it. And I think that this is a failure of us because I don't think we're vocal enough. Um, the only way to change things is the Toronto Star. It's the only way to do it. Um, when we approach the Ministry of Health, uh, we're looked at self-serving. We're just trying to increase our volume and get more. And so we need to do this in collaboration with patients and advocacy groups. And the times that I've had patients write a letter to the Star, they've had their operations within a week. Now, that's great for them, but it doesn't help the whole system. And so I think that, you know, and there's no indication that things are going to get any better. I suspect things are going to get worse. Um, CCO is out of control. They are not managing this appropriately. And if there's somebody from here from CCO, I'm happy to talk with them. But there's no indication things are going to improve. Um, so I think that we either just need to accept this crappy data um, or we need to be a little more proactive in changing things. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gottlieb? Yeah, <clears throat> fully agree with, with everything was said. I think that I'm all in favor of have, having timely surgery. However, for a tumor to become one centimeter, it takes a billion cells, 30 cells divisions. For that one centimeter tumor to become an eight centimeter tumor, it takes only three more cell divisions. So what is really that time before we get to the diagnosis and the, the importance of the time after? The time after being it weeks is almost nothing compared to the months or years it has been growing before. So I would tend to agree with Paul that it's probably all biology and not that little wait time. And again, I'm all in favor for a patient who has a cancer that she should be treated the next day but I don't think from, from, from the biology of a tumor, most of its history has been before the wait time. Mm -hmm. We don't have a measure for that, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, I'm glad there were no buns out there at the break because they might be coming at me. So I'm from Alberta and we have a fairly robust wait time assessment and it actually does make a difference. So now uh, the Ghani Yonk service is allowed to operate till five as a routine. And over Christmas and summer, we get more OR time. Certainly over Christmas, they actually say, can more of you operate? We get two rooms a day to, to shorten those times. So it is a very much a provincial initiative towards um, shortening wait times for cancer surgery. And is that provincial initiative a increased funding to your center to get you yes. access to that? Yeah, yeah it does. Okay. Sorry, just one more quick question. Yeah. Um, just looking at all your data, Laurie, and, and sort of following a little bit of what Al is saying, um, you know, we can do that. But the other way is when a patient feels they have a case that their outcomes has been negatively affected in the system, and they can sue to say that their outcome, uh, based on your data, you know, is there, are we getting close to a case for that? I can't tell you that I've heard of that being used yet. 